All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Jesse Berger. He's the author of Magic Internet Money, a book about Bitcoin, which he self-published in 2020. Jesse previously spent over a decade working with large financial institutions in Canada as a banker, investment advisor, and market research consultant, where he observed firsthand the perils of central banking and fiat currency. Today, he's an independent consultant based in Toronto, focused on Bitcoin adoption and education. Welcome, Jesse. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Bram. Well, thanks so much for coming on. It was great meeting you uh, in Madeira at the Bitcoin Atlantis uh, conference. Yeah, that was uh, an incredible event. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I uh, I had some previous episodes with people that I also met there, so it was a great opportunity to uh, to meet people you know from the internet. You know? Beautiful, <laughs> so that's, yeah, uh, that's that, always great. That's the best thing about these conferences is you know you end up turning around and bumping into someone. You start a conversation, and you oh you know I'll follow you on Twitter, yeah. or add me on Telegram or whatever. Oh, I I already follow you. I already yeah, talked exactly, to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's what we had, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I look. I, like? I was like, you're like you're Bram. Hey, I'm like oh oh I'm already following you. I didn't even yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, super fun, super fun. Well, uh, yeah, awesome. You're coming on. I uh, I love to see that you that you wrote a book. Still, one of my big goals is to just publish a book. Very cool. You self published as well, by the way. I think. Thank you. Uh, that's the that's the way to go um we'll talk about the book but first i wanted to ask like you you worked in traditional finance uh, so so did i for a while like can you share how you ended up there and can you recall like which events or information led you to question the fiat money system yeah very much so um so I graduated from university having studied economics and philosophy in 2006. Nice. And people always told me, oh, that's a strange combination, economics and philosophy. And I had this sort of canned response that I would always chirp back. I'd say, well, what's the point of learning about markets if you don't actually think about how they work? And at the time, it was- <laughs> that's good. I, at, and literally at the time, it was just like a one-liner that I would sp spit out in interviews. Um, I, you know, was I super serious, deep thinker about markets? No, not really. It was just, oh, that's sort of a cute line to say. But it ended up basically defining my career by the end of it and, and where I am today. Um, so I started in retail banking in 2006 after I graduated, which very basic opening bank accounts, credit cards. Um, doing mutual fund investments for retirement accounts, like very basic investing in banking, credit lines, mortgages, all that stuff. And shortly after my career began, the financial crisis hit. And I vividly remember when they did the first uh, TARP, I think it was called, where they had $600 billion to bail out the banks, the Troubled Asset Relief Program or whatever it was, TARP. Um, and I was sitting there sort of scratching my head going, so they just had six hundred billion dollars lying around that they're just giving me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was, I was literally like, it. They just had that, and they're just going to give it to the banks. Like, you know, my mom is an entrepreneur; she has a small business. If she fails, no one's just, oh, you know, here's a whole bunch of money. Don't worry about it. No sweat. Mm. I, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. So, I literally started down the rabbit hole of. Uh, what is money? And I'll, I'll quickly. So this is the back of my book. I just have what is nice. money because this was like my driving question for years. Um, so starting around 2007, 2008, I uh, started asking that question, discovered the world of Austrian economics and, you know, libertarian style uh, politics. And all of a sudden with that lens, again, remember, I studied economics in undergrad. And I didn't feel like I actually understood it by the time I graduated. Um, but looking at it through that lens, which I was not taught at school, but I literally retaught myself in 2008 mm. and 2009, all of a sudden, the world and the economics and money, it, it all just made so much sense to me. Because I think it's much closer to the truth about how the world works than, you know, Keynesian economics or traditional economics that might be taught in university. So that was my starting point for the money rabbit hole, but not specifically the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Yeah. 
I became a gold bug as a result, um, because that's what you do at that time when there is no Bitcoin is you buy a bunch of gold because, oh, dollars are going to collapse. They're just printing money. Gold was money for 5,000 years. It's scarce. It's limited. It's durable. Buy gold. So it made perfect sense. I started putting all my savings into gold, um, watched it do nothing for a decade, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Um, but basically, yeah, so I, I became a gold bug. I was working in banking. I ended up moving to wealth management after that where I managed um, investment accounts for high net worth individuals and corporations. I was a um, an associate portfolio manager, so I didn't I wasn't the fund runner myself, but I worked with a fund manager and just helped with all the clients and, you know, stock picking analysis, all that stuff, um, built constructing portfolios. So I did that for three years after I did retail banking for four years. And basically at the end of that time, gold had shot up to close to 1900 or 1950, whatever the peak was, just shy of 2000, and then crashed down to like 11 or 1200 again. And we were in this like, limbo period at gold at 1300. And I was just like, I, you know, nothing's happening. I don't see, you know, as much as I know money's broken, I, I just don't see this happening. I don't like what I'm doing. You know, I'm picking mm -hmm. gold mining stocks and oil stocks and like, I don't actually know what I'm doing. When the, these guys, all the guys I work with, they don't actually know. They're cowboys, you know? They're just throwing darts at the board, hoping something with sticks. other people's money, right? Literally, yes, with other yeah. people's money. And I'm like, <laughs> honest, like I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to help people. And I want obviously to make my clients money. But at the end of the day, I'm slowly observing all the guys around me. It's like, if a deal comes out, well, they'll buy the deal because there's a commission attached to it. It's like, well, we didn't need it in the portfolio. and We weren't considering it, but this deal came out. So let's do it. And I'm like, mm. uh, yeah, it, it's, I, was, I didn't feel good about myself. Um, and so I decided I wanted a career change. I went back to school. I got my MBA, uh, became a management consultant. I did a little bit of consulting for banks. I, had a, I was working on a huge project that was um, evaluating commercial defaulted borrowers or defaulted commercial borrowers, pardon me. So hmm. companies, small and medium size that uh, defaulted and just digging through the stories of why. And that was a really interesting sort of project, just seeing all the reasons that companies go under. Um, but I did that for a very short time before I wound up going to a, I, I wanted to get out of, like, I didn't want to be working on a bank project. So I managed to get myself hired by a very small consulting firm again in Toronto. The, all, everything was in Toronto for me. Um, working on the, uh, the Wall Street of Canada, Bay Street. Um, and so I worked for a small company that did market research for like customer experience. So if you ever get a survey after you, you know, you talk to a big corporation, they go, oh, how would you yeah. rate our service out of 10? I ran those kind of surveys. And so we'd collect all kinds of data um, from customers and try to give feedback to the companies about, okay, they like this product, they're not satisfied with this product, whatever. So I did that for a couple of years. And then we were talking just very briefly off air, 2017 came around and Sort of by dumb luck, I was reintroduced to the world of Bitcoin and 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 crypto and beyond. Um, I'll, I say reintroduced because I actually heard about Bitcoin in 2010, and I wanted to buy. I remember it was like a dollar, and I was talking yeah. to my buddies in wealth management. I was like, guys, we should put like a thousand bucks and just buy a bunch of Bitcoin, and we'll see what happens. And then we all looked at each other and were like, but wait, we're we're idiots. We're just idiot bankers. We don't know, <laughs> like. We wouldn't know what to do with this Bitcoin if we had it. I don't know from programming and apps and software. And again, there was no infrastructure at the time, right? There's no yeah. apps. There's no hardware devices. It was very rudimentary. So basically, we didn't do it because we're like, well, we're not going to go to a sketchy coffee shop and hand a guy cash and sit there and like 
we have to have our computer and I don't even know what I'm going to do. So Funny. didn't buy then. But, but it was still how it goes, right? Still how it goes sometimes. Most totally. bankers will probably think the same right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, funny. Um, so that was my first like contact with Bitcoin. I, I basically yeah. at that time, I understood very early on, I would say in 2010, 2011, three fundamental things about Bitcoin because I was already red pilled on sound money. I understood that Bitcoin is absolutely scarce, that there's only going to be 21 million coins that they're issued on a predetermined schedule. So the monetary, plus, I don't know why these balloons are popping up. I don't know if they <laughs> pop them up on your screen too. Um, yeah. That, um, sorry, the monetary policy was predetermined. There go the balloons again. Yeah. And uh, the third issue, the third thing I knew about Bitcoin was that there was no free money. The miners actually, there was a real world tangible cost to mining Bitcoin. So very early on, I understood those three things and I understood that, oh, this is like, interesting and mm. could very well be worthwhile but it wasn't until 2017 that i got reintroduced to it started to put all the pieces together not just the money side but then trying to understand okay how does mining yeah. work how does the chain work like how how does how do all the pieces kind of fit together putting together the economics and the game theory and the technology and uh i was initially brought into this world via the wider crypto world but ended up within a year after the big ico boom and bust you know, made some okay money on one or two coins, lost on 25 others. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah. And then, okay, now I, you know, I had to learn the lesson the hard way. And okay, now I understand why Bitcoin is the thing here. It's the innovation. It's, it's the only yeah. thing that matters. Um, and there's a million reasons why. And obviously we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit about some of those reasons as we go. Yeah. But uh, that was when I, I became just full blown Bitcoiner. It was about 2018, early 2018. Well, uh on the last thing you said, the, the, like the third element, like the, the Bitcoin doesn't appear from nowhere, right? I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting comparison to when you experienced that uh, in some way with the TAR program, there was 600 billion lying around, you know, where, well, or you thought it was lying around, but obviously that did appear from nowhere, yeah. right? Would you say that like... Because a lot of people, um, you know, that go against Bitcoin and proof of work and all the energy arguments, etc., like they don't understand that the proof of work is the innovation, right? Yes. The innovation is that you cannot randomly create it. So we have the schedule, we have the eventual supply, but we also have the consistency, um, uh, not only as to which they, uh, like how they appear, but also the work that needs to be done, like real electricity has to be consumed in order for the bitcoins to be created basically and that is the main innovation that they are locked into the future but you also have to do work to actually create them so the reward you get in the form of bitcoin as a miner comes from the work that you do whereas in the fiat world <laughs> randomly 600 billion just um, appears <laughs> appears out of nothing right and so even if that 600 billion would appear and work would have been done for it, like energy would have been expected in some way and, you know, stay captured in a way, then that would have been less bad even. But the fact that it can just be created by the press of a button, I think that is one of the main things why, you know, this system is, is very broken. But like, how do you, how do you see that? How, how do you see that now? If you look back as to your first understanding and, and your understanding now? Yeah, like I said, initially I understood just the let's call it the economic model, the right, the twenty one million, and that coins aren't free. Um, but eventually, right again, going to sort of twenty eighteen, I started putting together that there's the economic model combined with proof of work, which keeps the economic model in check, exactly. combined with the distrib the distribution of power and influence in Bitcoin, such that it is decentralized because nobody has mm -hmm. that like veto power in any way, shape or form over Bitcoin, which again, if we look at central banking, it you get that stark contrast. And that was very clear for me. And, and because I had worked in money and banking and, and understood the perils of this system where, okay, they just create it from nothing. Like Bitcoin's value proposition made a lot of sense to me earlier. And it, it, it was like, it was able to click for me quicker perhaps than most. Um, but yeah, those, that, that the proof of work 
the economic model, the, the decentralized nature of the network, the distribution of power between the different groups involved, whether it's nodes and developers and miners and uh, holders, putting all those elements together creates something totally unique and different and completely opposed to that fiat system where it's all just, you know, resting on one guy, the, you know, the, the Powell, you know, uh, Chairman Powell of the Fed and or whoever his predecessors were in Bernanke and Yellen and Greenspan, et cetera, and a little board of a dozen people who just decide, oh, you know what, today we need another $20 billion. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. very diametrically opposed. And once you understand the perils of one, the benefits of the other become that much clearer. So if someone who had a degree like you never learned what money was, even after his degree thought, oh, interesting, they just have 600 billion laying around and they can bail out the banks. How can a general citizen understand how the money that they use is actually broken? I mean, like you were in the right corner and you still didn't get, didn't get it, right? So like, how should people look at this? Carefully. <laughs> they should look at it carefully. And it's there's no easy path to understanding it, right? I, I wish it were the case that I could sit down with someone who is totally new to this idea and who said, okay, you know, I've grown up with dollars or euros or whatever it may be as my money system. And I just sit them down. And I say, here, this is how this one works. This is why it is making you poorer. It is programmed to depreciate. You are running on this hamster wheel and you know, you're, you're constantly having to keep up just to tread water. You're running faster and faster just to keep your head above water. You're never actually getting anywhere. Whereas you have this other system that, you know, if you get whatever you get, you earn your money and you save it, it's, it's just yours and it's there and it won't be debased and it won't be devalued. If, if it was that simple to just explain that to someone, you know, the world would be orange pilled already today, but for whatever yeah. reason, and I think the big reason is, I, I forget if you and I were talking about this in Madeira, maybe not, I, I, but I heard someone mention this recently. They have what's called uh, anchor bias. Mm. So if you, I think I, I heard it, to to credit the person correctly, I believe it was Pierre Richard, actually, I heard talking about this, but if you grew up with dollars as your money system, it's the only money you've ever known. It more or less works and everyone around you accepts it as yeah. this this works and this is how it is then if i say to you this system that you know and use and effectively believe in is wrong and hurting you and working against you it's as if you're attacking their character because it's part of their belief system and yeah. so there's a natural revulsion or repulsion to you know you can't say that about this thing that that I know to believe that I believe to be true, and so you have That's, to, yeah. in effect, I you know people have to feel the burn one way or another. Unfortunately, it, it's I think the rare person who can come at it, look at this from an intellectual perspective with a very open mind, and just go, "Oh yes, I see. I didn't understand how I was harmed by the fiat system, and I hmm. do see how Bitcoin can be beneficial." It's it's a very rare person you can come across that can do that for the most part people have to get hurt by the fiat system the same way for me it was 600 billion dollars just appeared and i yeah. happened to be thinking about that like oh how did that happen most people probably didn't ask the question like how did that happen where did that yeah. money come from they're so they're just I, happy that it exists or something right yeah I mean, it, and they, it is part of their it's part of their understanding of the world, I think, the anchoring bias as you describe it now, right? This is like, this is how I understand the world. And one part of that is money, whatever the currency is of your country. And then that is, that is it, yes. basically. Yes, yeah. exactly. So to, I mean, obviously we know that you need to have a degree of humility to accept that what I thought, what I believed may in fact have been wrong. Yeah. And I, I'm going to approach this thing that is novel and new and complex, and I'm going to slowly try to build up knowledge of it to understand it and eventually use it because there's likely to be, or I see a, a path where there's some benefit here. And that's yeah. a difficult thing to do. And there's no one, the nature of Bitcoin is that, right? You are personally responsible for your money. I can't 
You can't email the admin and say, oh, can you just make sure you send that money to such and such a person? Or can you reverse that transaction for me? Like that doesn't exist. It's not a bank. There's there's no safety net. And so, you, right, we people in Bitcoin talk about going on the hero's journey of both understanding and but also of of action of using Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's it's not easy at first, but once you wrap your head around it and practice a little bit, you know, the same way people couldn't use email 25 years ago. Now my grandma can email from her cell phone. So, yeah. you know, every, anyone can get there. It's just a yeah, matter exactly. of get, you know, doing a little bit of the work, putting in the proof of work. Yeah, I think one part is definitely the work. But the, the part before that is, I like what you said, that it, it could be just one like instance where someone thinks like, hmm, that's weird. Uh, I experienced or I shared on this podcast uh, lots of times before that when I was 30 and I was working at a bank and I had a mortgage uh, and I was already into Bitcoin. I didn't fully understand it yet, but then I had a colleague tell me in an hour lunch, like, do you know that the money in the bank is not yours? And I was like, <laughs> what? And then he explained to me and I was like, okay, I am stupid. <laughs> you know, I am participating in something I don't understand. And that for me was one of the biggest triggers, triggers to actually dive further, right? But what you said about you saw it in 2010 was a dollar. You actually said the words, maybe we should buy a thousand bucks. You didn't do it. Like what, what, what was the thing that didn't make you like, I don't want to say get it, but like do it, like take that action. Was that still like the trust in, like you were distrusting the fact that you had to meet this other person and you thought like, let's say something like an institution, like a bank was more trustworthy. Like, can you reflect on that a bit? I would say I didn't believe in myself enough at that point. Mm. I think if I'm being honest and true to myself, it's I didn't believe that I could figure out how to hold Bitcoin. And maybe I wouldn't have had the conviction to hold it, even if I had bought it. Maybe, okay, it goes from $1 to $10. And I think, wow, I'm a genius. I just 10x my money. Thinking that <laughs> thinking that dollars is still the money, right? Like that that might that probably would have been my mindset at the time. Yeah. So I I, I wasn't ready, but I also probably like I said didn't believe in myself in 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 the sense that I wouldn't have been ready to take that personal responsibility of I'm going to hold this Bitcoin. I understand the reasons and why. I have conviction in it and understanding. None of that was there. It was just yeah. sort of a flyer saying that, hey, this thing's worth one dollar and like this monetary policy is unique. Like that was that was the depth. It was very shallow thinking at the time. It was just, hey, yeah. maybe th there's some legs in this thing in dollar terms. I, I think I think this is the perfect answer because this is actually what still sometimes goes through my mind. You know, the not not trusting yourself, although you know rationally that you probably can you know if you put in enough enough work and i think that's a good thing to share to people even um i mean i've been in bitcoin for 10 years already if the price goes down like last week i still have this feeling like oh what what is going on you know and <laughs> although it went up like five you know uh what was it like 15k a week yeah before. but still it's and so it's it's like this ego game, right? And I and and then I do several things to just um, confirm my own understanding again, right? And then get to that point again, yes, <laughs> that I can uh, like consciously think to myself, okay, I can trust myself, like I know what this is, and I think that's this, right? Like like the the fact that you have to first agree that some things you thought you knew were wrong then you have to accept that what you thought was true is actually working against you. Then you have to integrate that understanding before, and then you have to spend time to figure out what is this other thing that apparently a lot of people are spending a lot of um, time and energy on, right? So, yes. I, you know, it is a lot, and it takes time to also, I like what you said about the responsibility, like take the responsibility of actually trusting in yourself something that, Apparently, before that, you didn't really have to do because you, you know, um, 
gave the responsibility over your money to other people you know like it's a really yeah, big you, thing you, you know? gave the responsibility of your money over to an idiot like me at the time right you exactly know? Yeah. you know it's oh here's this <laughs> yeah. kid in the you know the portfolio manager yeah. he's working with and they they seem to really yeah. understand what's going on you know they they talk that about for it high net worth individuals so uh yeah. no shame in that right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's yeah. it's not just yeah. plebs it was you know we were working with yeah. some very successful people and they're trusting you know, not just me but they're trusting us mm -hmm. to make the responsible decision to have a game plan. <laughs> but the stock market is just a casino. <laughs> it's just a yeah, casino. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very rare these days that, you know, valuations really matter. Like, the, you know, that doesn't seem yeah, to be the case. It's incredible. Yeah. So what eventually, so you went further down the rabbit hole, but what eventually um, inspired you to like dive even more into it and, and write your book? Right. So at the time, so call it 2017, 2018, I, I left my job in 2018 and I, I just knew that I, I need to do something in this space um, and I need to contribute to Bitcoin or work in Bitcoin and help people understand Bitcoin. And so I went on a bit of a journey. It was a topsy-turvy journey of trying a few different things. Most of them didn't work out, but there was good um writing basically there were there were good essayists and authors um i think safe dean's book i think the bitcoin standard came out in 2018 but there were a number of other writers um publishing just online at the time whether it's jimmy song and i'll mention some guys um that at the time inspired me like robert breedlove nick cart some of nick carter's articles dan held pierre richard going back to the nakamoto institute and reading pierre richard and bitstein um, there was, and Gigi, uh, his articles are sensational, but basically I started reading all these things and I thought, okay, like the, I love them all. How can I, I, I want to get more people into Bitcoin because I see this vision. I have the, you know, I see the benefits of Bitcoin in front of me. How do I get people to come into Bitcoin? So my initial thought was, well, I, get, I used to work in wealth management. Maybe I'll put together a pitch deck and try to raise money and I'll hold Bitcoin. I'll buy Bitcoin for a bunch of high net worth investors, which was a terrible idea. And thankfully, I didn't do it. But because then I'm just holding other people's money, which I didn't want to actually do. <laughs> um, but I, in my head, I was like, well, but I'm just saying buy Bitcoin. That's it. It's not anything else. Um, so I worked on this pitch deck and within a couple of weeks I had like 80 slides it, and it was all text. It was all words. It was, it was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I showed a friend of mine. He's like, Jesse, you're an idiot. No one's going to sit through a five hour presentation, but this is a great skeleton for a book. And mm. I went to bed that night. I was like, what's he talking about? I can't write a book. And I woke up the next morning. I was like, this is actually a great idea. Well, you know, this is a great way I can sort of monetize the work I'm putting into my own research and understanding. I can build a little bit of a name for myself. Um, but also more, most importantly is I can actually help people learn about Bitcoin. Um, and so basically my goal was if you think of Bitcoin knowledge on a scale of one to 10, where one is, you know, nothing or zero, you know, nothing, but you know, one, you know, very little 10, you're an expert. And basically we'll say absolutely nobody's a 10, the Adam backs and NBKs and whatever the world, let's say they're nines. Cause I think they would also say that about themselves. Um, I'm at a four to five, you know, five is probably a little generous, but my goal is to take people that are down at the zero, one and two and bring them up to, you know, a two, three, maybe four. Mm -hmm. So that yep. was sort of the goal of my book is let me bring people into the shallow end of Bitcoin, introduce them to, there are a number of different disciplines in Bitcoin, right? It's a multidisciplinary thing, <laughs> uh, yeah. network. So you need to understand a little bit about economics and money and there's game theory and politics and technology and your, so I try to draw from all these different sections and really, again, just give them an introduction to all of them. And, but at the same time, build a little bit of a story arc. Like my book is a nonfiction book, but I tried to tell the story of Bitcoin with a little bit of uh, bravado, shall we say, and give it a little bit of flair for the dramatic so that, you know, it, it felt more appealing and friendly than, mm -hmm. oh, this super complex thing. And that's why the book cover is very, um, you know, it's, it's a cartoon wizard. It's inspired by the initial 
Magic Internet Money forum image, if you know. I mean, the, uh, the Reddit, Bitcoin Reddit forum, that like 8-bit wizard. So I took that wizard and basically tried to elaborate on it to make a more interesting design. But um, the format of the book, and I'll, I guess I'll show it off for a minute for you. Every page is its own, has its own title, a quote, and then just one page. Every, every, nice. every page, there's full page images. So again, it's very friendly. You just have to go one page at a time. So it's trying not to be intimidating. It's trying to be very friendly. And I'm building up your knowledge of Bitcoin sort of block by block. Just one little, you bite off one little bit at a time. And eventually, hopefully you can stand back and see that, okay, I've constructed, you know, this, this initial view and or an initial image that you might have of Bitcoin. And from there, you know, if you like this particular rabbit hole or that particular rabbit hole, you'll go off and, and find more and more about that. And, and I'm just sort of, like I said, I'm, I'm the Walmart greeter ushering you in through the door, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> giving nice. you that first introduction, first touch point, and then you can go dive off into the deep end thereafter. Yeah. So it's not a trick question, but can you explain the concept of money like I'm five? <sighs> yeah. I guess. Uh, let's How do you see. do it in the book? I do. You know what? Here, let's let me try something here. I'm going to yeah, read yeah, yeah. just it. two paragraphs for you, and we'll see okay. if that explains money. Money is a means to an end to facilitate the efficient allocation of resources in society. It was first invented to allow barter economies to grow beyond their natural limits by acting as a liquid, precise, and valuable medium for commerce. Fundamentally. Sound money allows for fair and fluid trading by accurately measuring prices, creating conditions for productivity to improve, generating economic growth like a rising tide lifting all boats. If defective, however, money can have the opposite effect, confusing trade markets by distorting the pricing mechanism, causing valuable resources to be misallocated, thereby weakening an economy's efficacy. Uh, I could probably stop there, but I'll, yeah, well, I'll keep going. Some economists with a preference for free market ideology, most notably those from the Austrian school of thought, have long questioned the ability of the legacy monetary system to beneficially allocate resources and stimulate growth. Although it has served for many decades, entrenching itself in the global economy, it shows signs of defect, misuse, and fragility. Having studied these deficiencies, Satoshi equipped Bitcoin with attributes and abilities intended to overcome the current system's shortcomings and to compete on a universal level for monetary value and mindshare. By virtue of its existence, Bitcoin publicly challenges our underlying assumptions about money, as well as the role of the gatekeepers tasked with determining its governance policies. To find out how, it must first be understood. It, to find out how, it must first be understood what makes for sound money. Nice. Yeah. So that's one page. And nice. one, one idea, what is, what is money? So it's a, it's a means to an end. It's, it facilitates trade. It, it's, it's the grease of, you know, the wheels of economic activity. If the yeah. grease is, you know, fluid, great. And, you know, the wheels spin good. If it's all gunky and, you know, Oh, mm -hmm. you know, sorry, this is a terrible analogy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. I, I know I like it because I'm. I'm trying to. I'm working on on an illustration. I'll not show it yet, but I'm working on an illustration. Like what? What I what I love. Just I'm trying to get like what is the simplest explanation, right? And and so I think your start is great. And what I would like to add is because it's a representation of productivity, right? energy spent in a in a certain time to do well whatever you get rewarded for right if your reward is in something that is well what we call soft money right money that can be created well by the print of a button what we talked about if it can be created infinitely why are you trading in your finite resources like your energy in a certain time right your time is your most finite uh, source why are you trading that in for something infinite Yes. For something so soft. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And if you trade it in for something hard, then you actually also have to do your best to earn that hard money. Yes. And when you own so. the hard money and you're going to spend the hard money, you're going to be very picky 
as to what you are going to spend it on, right? And so your example of how governments just misallocate funds, etc., that's because the money that they have is too soft. It's not hard enough. Like if it was hard enough, they would not go with nonsense plans just based on assumptions and not researched and whatever, right? Like the people that were pitching to get that money for whatever project, they would actually have to show real value before getting the hard money, right? And so I'm kind of like on this train of thought for the past few weeks. Like I want to see how we can simplify that because I think there's something there's something in there because that's where you see like the, the total opposite of the incentives, right? I, the one incentive is I'm spending like crazy and the other is, well, show me what I should spend it on, right? Like that's, it's just different. I actually distilled that, the idea, the exact idea you're describing, I basically distilled that into like, two pages in chapter four of my book okay send it <laughs> <What's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah i didn't get a chance to get a copy but that's okay i should yeah but this is fun like because I, I what i like is that you know i came here by listening to others and just trying to also figure it out for myself like what is the best way that i can explain it to other people actually last weekend we had friends over for brunch and i did this and uh there was a couple and he's already into Bitcoin. Nice. And she a little bit through him. And she told me, I never looked at it this way. And then I thought, yes, you know, like, because that's the whole goal. Like you cannot orange pill someone else, but you can create something in their mind where they think like, damn, I know this now. I need to figure this out. You know, like uh, this is something I need to understand. And I think, I think I got there with her, but it's fun to to test that and then also like i would love to read what you wrote down right like i feel like that is especially the way also for for all of us who understand bitcoin already to a certain degree to get to a point where it becomes more i don't want to say simple but more straightforward like like your pitch of economics and philosophy like just a one sentence yeah. thing, like why bitcoin like it would be great if we could like end up there. I, I did my <laughs> best to, so I'll, I did my best to waste zero words in my book. And the best I could do is there's a, it's about 120 pages. It's still a very short book. Uh, but to the best of my ability, that was how I could pitch Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, no, great. <laughs> in, 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 written for, in, a, in a written format anyway. But, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. The, the concept that I, I, I'm a big fan of trying to understand or help people understand that when money is sort of easy come, easy go, there's a lot of mm -hmm. it. You don't really think as much about spending because, well, the money's just going to keep coming in. They're going to print more. The asset's going to inflate. I'll borrow against it. I'll get a, a student loan. I'll get a business loan. Da, 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 you know, whatever it is, there's just more money sloshing around. It's easy to come by. Um, with Bitcoin, you have to be very discerning and picky with how you spend because it's very difficult to acquire. Yeah, it, it's very difficult exactly. to acquire Bitcoin. So if I spend my time and energy and work to whether I'm buying it for dollars or whether I'm earning it via work or whether that's mining or actually some kind of skilled labor of some kind, I've put in this work and I've earned it. I'm not just going to go, okay, you know, participate in the consumer economy and blow it on a bunch of nonsense that yeah, I, I'm not going to have in a year. I'm not going to care about. No, it's I want to spend it on something that a is meaningful, that's going to be enduring, that has some kind of significance to me, um, or that is very useful to me. And that will also, you know, ideally will also endure. But um, you, yeah. you definitely think differently about spending Bitcoin than you do about spending dollars. I think yeah. anyone in Bitcoin would tell you that. Yeah, 100%. So I do know that in the book, you talk about the concept of a modern monetary renaissance. How does how does Bitcoin fit into this renaissance? Yeah, the way I, I look at it is Bitcoin is the renaissance for money. It is um, a fire in cyberspace that is, uh, it, it's, I think I actually had this description in the book. I said, Bitcoin created a crater in our collective consciousness about money. It, it, it arrived like a literal meteor from space, crashing yeah. into the World Wide Web its remnants distributed across the web for people to pick up and look at and, and observe and use. And it changed the landscape of money just by virtue of its arrival, right? Mm. A meteor comes, it strikes, it shakes the ground. That's what Bitcoin was. It, it shook things up 
And so it is the renaissance for money. And again, it creates this dichotomy of, well, I know the fiat system is messed up and yeah, we had gold, but gold has its flaws. And, you know, lots of people have talked about that, the, the, just that it tends to centralize and it's not ideal for commerce. Bitcoin is very easy to use. I could send you Bitcoin right now. You're in another country, another time zone. You could send it right back. We could do that, you know, before I finish this sentence. Um, I can't do that with gold. Um, mm. But it shook things up and, and that's the renaissance. And it's, all, and it's also a renaissance in the sense that it's an elegant solution. It's beautiful. It has integrity. It's available to everyone. It's knowledge available to all. Um, so that's sort of what I meant by it's, it's a renaissance for money. It's bringing the thinking back to money, right? Before it was sort of an unthinking thing where it's sub, we all just use money subconsciously. We don't care. We don't think about it. Okay, they yeah, bailed exactly. out the banks. <laughs> now Bitcoin gives you pause and you actually have to think, wait, what is money? How does it work? Or it's one more reason, I should say, right? TARP being my initial reason before Bitcoin existed, but it's it's a big reason now to really consider that question. Yeah. And so that's the renaissance. Well, I do think it can also bring us a renaissance, right? Like what we talked about, if if Bitcoin becomes more adopted and more people will ask for Bitcoin in return for the energy that they spend, right? The, the work that they do, then um, if it plays out, like we just said, if people get more picky and they have to build more quality things, then um, yeah, I said this before a lot too. I live in a hundred year old house and I have really pretty doors, yeah. for example, <laughs> right? Like this carpenter a hundred years ago was like, mm, I'm going to make a pretty, a pretty door, yeah, right, and just like the fireplaces, all these like uh, little details and stuff. And now everything is so boring, yeah, right. It's all flat and straight and I, basic I, materials and all these things, I, right? You yeah. should you should see the houses where I live. I, I'm I'm in Toronto, Canada, and you should see the houses. It's very just boxes made yeah, of exactly. you know yeah, glass, yeah. It's and very concrete. boring, but it's, it's exceedingly but it makes boring. sense, right? Yeah, if your if your reward is something. Right, and in the money that you get is well, and in Canada it's even worse, right? With inflation, like it, it, if the energy that you receive in the form of money from your work is basically debased in the next six months, why would you spend like uh, quality energy on the thing you're creating? Right, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like you, you your incentive is just not big enough. No. And that's when you create just boring stuff. You are not incentivized to think or be creative or um yeah think outside of the box or whatever like do something new that nobody did before like this it's just that the incentive is not there i don't think it's necessarily about the individuals that create it but it's more like yeah it just makes sense like why would you do your best i, I like i understand you yeah know? and that's what we see in the architect architecture or art or you know stuff like that yeah absolutely it's you know the incentive is everything right like money is a system of incentives. Fiat is a system of incentives. It happens to be what I think all Bitcoiners would agree is the wrong incentive and a broken incentive mm. that it doesn't lead to, like the outcome of that incentive is to either create shoddy things or things that won't endure and they're not beautiful. It's just, it's quick, it's myopic, it's short-term thinking. Bitcoin is the opposite of that. It's much more long-term thinking. I want to spend my time and energy wisely. I want to create something lasting that not only I can enjoy, my children can enjoy, their children can enjoy. I want to create a better, beautiful world. So yeah, Bitcoin yeah. is like money is itself an incentive system. And if you have yeah. a better, a good incentive, I actually, one of the other things I, I mentioned in the intro, I think to the book is if you, you know, money, um, if you have good money, you have good socioeconomic outcomes. If you have bad money, you have bad socioeconomic outcomes. That's a very simple pitch right there. You were, you were to ask mm. about a pitch earlier. But, yeah. but to, to understand that, you have to actually start thinking, well, what makes something good or bad money? Yeah, and exactly. What are, yes. And what are the yeah. incentives? And then you go down. Because you want the first, yeah. right? Not the latter, yeah. right? And then, yeah, 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 but then you I have agree. to go down that whole rabbit hole of knocking over a bunch of dominoes of how does money work and how does it affect the economy and how do people react and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so the goal of the book is to invite people to think, rethink the role of money in society and challenge like the assumptions that they have. What 
do you believe is the most critical aspect of money that most people need to reconsider or think about? Oh, that's a really good question. The most important aspect of money that people need to reconsider, um, probably that it, who, quote, runs money or, or dictates money in the sense that currently we have these small boards, right? The, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors that dictate how money works, how much is issued, what the price of money is in terms of interest rates. Why can't that be programmed? Why can't that be fair and clear and transparent? Um, so the literal operating system of money, like it, basically the heart of it is what we yeah. need to think about. And it's um, right. Cause it, it all, it's all wrapped together. Um, but it, yeah. it it's, yeah, getting people to to think about it, it's it's tricky because people, you know, we talk about you got to pay the bills, you got to pay the mortgage. There's no time sometimes to think about it. You're on this hamster wheel. It's, well, I can't get Definitely. off because if I get off the hamster wheel, I'm going to fall behind and then I'm in big trouble. So I have to keep running on the hamster wheel. And if I'm running on the hamster wheel, I'm not taking the time to think about why I'm even running on the hamster wheel. Yeah, I agree. I'm trying to quickly. I love this answer because I I agree. I'm trying to look up. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I, I I tweeted this about this. So it's for me, it's the rulers versus rules, right? Is yes. what you say. Like, do you uh, want to follow rulers or do you want to follow rules? Yes, so my tweet that, was: You might have heard the expression with Bitcoin, you follow rules instead of rulers. This means that everyone voluntarily agrees to the transparent rules that everyone voluntarily agrees to. Compared to everyone must agree to the opaque rules that a small set of rulers have agreed to. A hundred percent. The result when we follow the, the, the rules is all the users of the system incentivize all the users of the system to keep the system <laughs> open, honest, and decentralized and secure. And therefore, it will never be gamed or ever die, right? And I think this is the big contradiction is like, do you want to follow this small group of people that you don't know maybe you know the powell guy right but he definitely doesn't care that you are yeah. jesse all you know is you know? all you know is his name you don't know much about all him. you know is his you, name you don't know what right? data is actually driving his decisions you know so you have to trust this other human or do you just want to trust yourself basically that you understand the rules yeah. and that all the other people that um participate in this money system also understand the rules and they are incentivized to Ob obliged by the rules right and that is that is it yeah but so i love that you said that because for me this is probably also i think the biggest thing that i came to realize that you know when we were younger probably the argument well but these people studied for it and they know <laughs> yeah. and they have a career like that that would have been like enough but now i'm like it doesn't make sense because the people that use the money should choose the money right yeah. like it's not a, a small group of people that should choose like it makes total logical sense to me now yeah it but at yeah. the end of the day you know every individual has to make a choice right that's like that's a huge component of you, you you are choosing to use fiat instead of bitcoin there's an opportunity cost of using fiat yes. instead of bitcoin or vice versa and you have to understand the ramifications and the risks and benefits associated with both but at the end of the day, you know, if you're waiting for someone else to tell you which one to use, they may herd you into a system that doesn't benefit you and they're somehow going to game it. Whereas with Bitcoin, yes, you're taking that bit of responsibility and you're doing the work and trying to verify for yourself instead of trusting others. But you're playing a game. This, there's, I forget who said this, but um, Bitcoin is a game where everyone watches everyone else to make sure nobody cheats. Exactly. That's, yes. that's what Bitcoin. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a really good that's, one. Um, yeah. So that you can you can play that game. Anyone can play that game. You can you can watch everyone else. Make sure no one else is cheating. They're all going to be watching you. Make sure you're not cheating, and you're going to have a level playing field as a result of that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so you said, uh, I think rightly so that um, Bitcoin has all these different dimensions, right? It's about finance. Eco uh, economics, cryptography, it's math, uh, it's about uh, social economic stuff, it's about geopolitics, it's about macro, <laughs> game theory, all these things. Which, which topic was the most challenging to break down in plain language for the book? Oddly enough, I, I thought I'd have a really easy time writing about money because I worked in 
banking and wealth management. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually had the most difficulty do it, writing mm. that one out. The money and, and economics. I, I called chapter four is called growth. It's basically economics. I just didn't want to call it economics. Um, but writing those two chapters, which I thought were my bread and butter and I would have the easiest time with, those ones were the hardest to really make it clear and, and do it right. And I, I took on some difficult chat. I wrote about governance in one chapter. I wrote about freedom in another. Um, drawbacks, although drawbacks I, I found was, uh, I, I enjoyed writing drawbacks. And I, it, it's not that it was hard. It was that I just, I, you know, that was my longest chapter intentionally. I wanted to intentionally include potential drawbacks of Bitcoin to show that I'm trying to be critical of my own work and my own views and yeah. paint the picture that, okay, like not, nothing in life is perfect. Bitcoin may be as close as we know, but there's nothing perfect and we have to be vigilant and there's pitfalls that may arise and we have to, you know, can Bitcoin defend against those things anyway? Um, yeah. So I took on a few challenges that were perhaps out of my normal wheelhouse, but it was money and economics that I, I, I probably rewrote the chapter on, on economics like four times. Or growth four times. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Well, and so what? What is the most like common misconception about Bitcoin that you find most important to um, to debunk or uh, have counter argument to? I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example of for this. So, I recently spoke to just a small group in Toronto. It was like four people. I just sort of went over to someone's house for an evening because I knew had met or knew them personally. Um, and they wanted to just chat about Bitcoin with a couple of their friends. So I said, yeah, sure. I'll come sort of just educate and inform. And so I talked for a couple hours and then we, you know, they asked me a bunch of questions and we just have a nice conversation for, for an evening. And at the end of the day, so this woman is a uh, reg registered massage therapist and she says, yeah, you know, I, um, yeah, I like it. You know, I, I don't think I'm ready to buy. And sure, you know, to each their own. Okay, you're not ready to buy. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm interested. Maybe I'll follow up. And it's really interesting. And I said, well, you know, you don't have to buy. You know, you could just offer people to pay you in Bitcoin for your services. And she's like, what? What do you mean? And, and so literally the concept that Bitcoin is, is just digital cash, literally the, the two main functions are send and receive and yes. like that goes over a lot of people's heads in all of this i think because they look at it as this very complex asset that is a new technology and it has all and is mining and what is mining and how does that work and every you know people are always asking oh well what is mining and how does it work and i don't know is that ethical is that environmentally friendly blah 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 but she i said to her I, you could just accept this as payment because it's money. And she was like, oh, I never even thought of that. And I realized, you know, and <laughs> I'm like, it's almost like talked for hours. I may, I may have been pitching this wrong. I may have been explaining this yeah. wrong. I mean, I'm explaining well, the value proposition and the scarcity feedback. and the, 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 the poor nature of the fiat system, but really you can just, it's just money. So I think that actually gets lost in these deep yeah. philosophical, you know, talks about Bitcoin. Is that well, it is the answer to your first question, right? Like, do you want, um, what did you say, like a good society yeah. or like the good socioeconomic right? then, outcomes or bad socioeconomic outcomes? Exactly, yeah. you need good, good money. And then the first question is, well, is the money I have not good enough? The answer is no, yeah. <laughs> so, what is a better money? And then you then it's like, Bitcoin is a better money, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it starts there. Maybe it's that, but see, like, I love this because what you said. You know, when you say like you're a five or a six, I think, uh, I don't know, I would classify myself <laughs> also in that range, maybe a six, I don't know, yeah. but like you learn as you go, right? It's, it's, that's why also making this podcast is so fun. Like I also still learn as I go. And I love this example, like you said, like that will definitely help me to, to talk about it differently as well. And I love that this is, well, it's funny because this is the, essential problem that it solves right it's yeah. how do i exchange value in something that doesn't lose its value after i received it yeah and you and you that's, say that that's the problem and you say that and people go yeah sure okay well catch the game last night how do you know like you know let's change the topic this is a little too complicated to talk yeah. about but if i say to them 
you know, I could just pay you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's super fun. So, what can you share um, a, a personal experience or realization during like exploring this, writing the book that was most impactful on your life or your your general perspective? Um, I mean, writing the book was an ex like I it was an exercise in doing my own research effectively. I had a vision of Bitcoin in my head, an under an understanding, or so I thought, of Bitcoin. And as I go through the different chapters and disciplines, you know, I learn a little bit more about each. I don't know that I necessarily encountered uh actually you know what? No. Now that I'm rethinking about it, I will give you a, a more concrete example. Um I was going to say that, like, you know, I just expanded my horizons on each topic. But I remember vividly, I, I, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that I, I rewrote the growth chapter a number of times. One of my big aha moments where I had started writing it for the second time or whatever it was, um, I had just finished Breed Love's, one of his first big articles, uh, Time and the Tyranny of, of Absolute Scarcity. It's I forget the exact name, but it's... I read that article and I remember looking at my chapter and thinking, I go, I didn't mention time once mm. in this article. And and time is a factor in money and economics and, and all of this, right? I, at Madeira, Jack uh, Mahler's opening remarks, he had a huge segment on on time. And so, you know, people can watch that on, on YouTube later if they want. Um, but I didn't account for time whatsoever. And so I remember having this sort of aha moment, scratch that, what I had written and basically had to start again. Um, but trying to incorporate time preference, right? That vision of there's the myopia of fiat of, well, it's consumerism. It's, you know, just fast items, fast food, fast fashion, fast yep. art, you know, just garbage art displays. We're talking about, you know, the, the concrete houses in Toronto, the square you know nonsense that's not original and beautiful and innovative that's the time element of well i have short like I, I can only see two inches in front of my face because of fiat bitcoin as it as it relates to time you have to think further ahead further into the future and it changes your perspective and basically perhaps you know that seed was probably already in my head to some degree but i i really snapped back to that when I had read Breed Love's article. And then I'm mm. like, well, I have to account for this in, in my book. Yeah. So that was a big one for me. Nice. Yeah. I also think about, you mentioned uh, Der Gigi uh, before, but like he, he, has, he has an article called Bitcoin is Time. Yep. Uh, so for the people listening, if you Google Bitcoin is Time by Der, D, Der Gigi, D-E-R-G-I-G-I, -I, that's probably one of the most mind mind blowing articles uh, around Bitcoin and time. And this, I think. this from 10 years ago, by the way. He, so he got it. <laughs> he also wrote an article called uh, Bitcoin is Gravity or Bitcoin's Gravity. Mm. Part not Bitcoin is Gravity, but Bitcoin's Gravity. And so this chart that I have, I called it Bitcoin's Utility Value Feedback Loop, is effectively an adaptation mm, nice. of, of a chart that he had had in his article. And I tried to cite him there as sort of inspiring that one. Yeah, but yeah, Bitcoin's well, writing. I mean, sorry, Dershishi's writings, all of them are are truly yeah. excellent. Yeah. Well, if you think about Bitcoin's gravity, right? I like the idea of, uh, and that's attached to what we talked about before, right? If there is not soft money anymore, which makes you not put your best forward in terms of productivity, right? Like energy spent in time. Um, hard money, the hardest money to ever exist, like Bitcoin, will actually have you put your productivity into it and also uh, price your productivity in Bitcoin, right? And I think that is when you, when you think about why will Bitcoin become more valuable? So that doesn't only mean the price goes up, but more desirable. Yeah. Uh, the price going up is a result of be it being more desirable and valuable. It's because I believe that once people understand that they can be, if they really add value, they can be rewarded 
in the hardest money to ever exist, all the productivity, all the energy spent in X amount of time will flow into Bitcoin because that energy will be stored in Bitcoin. And, and for me, that's the gravity of Bitcoin. It will attract real value, real productivity of, of people because uh, I think that's another uh, law, right? There's a lot of laws. There's a lot in of laws around, yeah. Gresham's law. Gresham's law yeah. is... Uh, People ditch the bad money for the good yep. for the good money, right? And I think this is it. So once you understand that you can price whatever your job is or your venture or, you know, well, you can be a massage therapist. Like you can ask, if you're really good, then people will give you Bitcoin for it, you know? And uh, that is, I think that is very real and, and more people will, will discover that. But like when, when we see that happen, like what... How will the future look like, you think? Like, how will it be, be brighter, better, more beautiful? All the ways. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, in terms of, I, you know, I think of how much waste there is in the fiat system, right? Like, I spent seven years in banking and wealth management. So four years in retail banking and three years in wealth management. How much of that was useless or or could have been done by bitcoin as a program the the banking mm. side in terms of having a bank account okay well you have a bitcoin wallet there's your bank account um your savings account or your investments bitcoin checks that box too it's it's both savings and investment effectively at the same time because it not only preserves value but and cash but grows <laughs> value so. and it's cash yeah yeah so all the people you know, and I, I, I envision in my head, because I'm in Toronto, I envision the office towers downtown of all the guys who shuffle their feet and, you know, drive their cars and take the subway. And they, they go into these towers and the lights are on and they're printing papers and they're running around back and forth. And they're calling each other, just getting on this deal and that deal. How much <laughs> of that is waste? Is just everyone just saving Bitcoin and we have money and we don't need to bother with 99% of this stuff. It's it's just waste. We're 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 literally shuffling papers back and forth. It's nonsense. Yeah. So it's it's hard to envision the beauty and the grandeur, and because we will never see anything like we can't even imagine it. Really, we don't know what it'll be. We have inspiration to draw from from eras of the past where they created beautiful things on better money standards, but this is as you said the hardest money that has ever been they had hard money in the, in the form of gold and that allowed them to create some some beautiful things but gold was not all the way perfectly absolutely scarce yeah so what will it be i don't know but i all i when i think about it i mostly think about all these people doing nonsense they're going to free up their time pursue creative endeavors things that fill their hearts and souls and make them feel good about themselves instead of oh i gotta i'm getting my soul is being torn away from me going to work to pay the mortgage to run on the hamster wheel that i'm exhausted from so i don't know exactly what it'll look like but i know a lot of that waste will go away and so i'm, I'm you know that's I, I see that side more than i see necessarily mm. the beauty and the the grandeur that will come although you know it's fun to dream about but all yeah. our dream, we'll be able to try to fulfill as many of our dreams as we possibly can, as we, you know, with the naturally scarce resources at our disposal, you know, what can we create with those things? We'll, we will allocate them as efficiently and effectively as humanly possible. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think to add to that, like, it also doesn't matter what someone then we'll do right like it's it is about you can do whatever you want yeah. whatever you think you are here to contribute to the world that's the entire point right yeah. and so it's not about value can also be that you make the best bread or you paint the best art a or that it, it, it's not about um high earning type job that that's not what it's about no. because if we have that money that stays at the same value then it, i don't know for me it feels like it levels uh, i don't like this expression but leveling the playing field in the sense that like you can actually we can actually have like a meritocracy because now some people are stuck on that hamster wheel as you mentioned doing stuff they don't like yeah. <laughs> but they cannot even 
they don't even have the time to think about what would I actually love doing. Maybe I have to study for that or I don't know. Yeah. Right. But they, they, they don't even have the space, the, the, the time space yes. to explore that. Right. And once we can create that time space for people to explore that, everyone will be more happy. <laughs> I think it will certainly uh, be a happiness will go up. Yeah. Happiness will go up in my view for sure. I agree with you on that. Happiness, prosperity. Um, but just fulfillment, right? Like people are going to be filling their cups. So exactly. I, you know, I'm the greatest barista in the world. You know, I make the most beautiful designs whatever. and the coffee, yeah, whatever, whatever exactly. it is, you can show yeah. that off and be proud of it. And, and you will have, as you said, the time space to, to pursue those things that, that fill your cup. Yeah. All right. Last question. Sure. And I ask everyone the same, the same question. What's a core belief you will never let go? I've had to everyone sl- size I've had, too. I've had to sl- <laughs> I've had to slay a few core beliefs these last five years, let's say, or four years. Um, one that I won't let go. You know th- that just you have the power to make your life as beautiful and fun and fulfilling as possible. I think no one should ever let go of that belief that you know you can do and be more than you are if it's the case that you want to do and be more um and that'll be true on a fiat stand on a fiat standard or a bitcoin standard there will people who you know have self-doubt um who need inspiration and hopefully on a bitcoin standard they'll find more people to help inspire them and they'll have more time space to be able to do that but yeah i i i guess i'll i'll give you that Thanks, man. I love that. Really enjoyed this conversation and uh, let's do it uh, again in the future. I uh, I will link to your Twitter or X. I always <laughs> yeah, whatever. say Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I'll link to your book so people can check it out. And uh, yeah, thanks again, man. It was a great, uh, great convo. Thank you, Bram. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.